In a recent video, I asked if you had to name one mathematician that a random high school graduate would know to save the life of your mom, who would you name? People disagreed with me, as they often do, but nobody disagreed that for the question to be at all interesting, we would have to exclude Pythagoras. Whoops, sorry, wrong guy, Pythagoras. And of course, that's because everybody knows the Pythagorean theorem, which tells us that on a right-angled triangle, the sum of the squares on the legs of the right triangle is equal to the square on the right triangle's hypotenuse. And in a geometry class, students will typically learn not just the theorem, but also how to prove it. Interestingly, we don't know how Pythagoras proved it, or in fact, if he proved it at all. But we do know how Euclid proved it in his legendary textbook, The Elements. I don't even have to open the book to show you the proof because the method is shown on on the cover. The Pythagorean theorem is essentially the last proposition in book one of Euclid's Elements. And in this construction, you can see that Euclid begins with an arbitrary right triangle and then constructs squares on the legs and he actually constructs rectangles on the hypotenuse. The two rectangles form a square and with some basic geometric arguments, including a statement that's equivalent to the parallel postulate, the theorem is proved. And this is, especially for a proof that's so often presented to beginners, not particularly easy to follow. The Pythagorean theorem has been proved hundreds of different ways, and certainly many of them are more simple than the one that Euclid used in the elements. Today, I wanna show you what's probably the simplest proof of the Pythagorean theorem. It's very possible you were not taught this proof in school, though, as always, your mileage may vary. Once we go through that quick proof, I want to talk about why Euclid might not have used it in his book, which also serve as reasons why you might not have been taught the proof in school. Indeed, some other simpler proofs you might have learned include this one, which is like a more algebraic version of what's sometimes called the Chinese proof of the theorem, and of course the classic proof using a trapezoid, which was provided by US President James Garfield. But in my opinion, neither of these are the simple simplest Pythagorean theorem proof. Let me show you that one. Certainly, one measure of the complexity of a Pythag theorem proof is the construction involved. And this proof is pretty much perfect. You just start with an arbitrary right triangle, and then from the right angle, we're going to drop an altitude to the opposite side. So this segment goes from that right angle and intersects the base at a another right angle. Of course, both of these angles are 90 degrees. I've just labeled this one to keep things not cluttered. So now we have two of these smaller right triangles. And what's important to note is that they're actually both similar to the bigger right triangle. Now to start laying out the arguments, let's label the vertices of our right triangle, A, B, and C. And we'll say where the altitude intersects the base is a point called D. So regarding the first similarity relationship that we claim here, triangle ADC is similar to the big triangle ACB. We know this because all of their angles are equal. They share this angle here at angle A, and they both have a right angle. The small triangle has this right angle, and the big one has this right angle at vertex C. So for sure, they are similar triangles. Remember that two pairs of congruent angles forces the third pair to be congruent as well. Now, the other similarity relationship is that this right triangle, CDB, is congruent to, again, the big right triangle, ACB. Again, we know this because of angle relationships, and it will be helpful for us to name one of these angles. Let's call this angle at vertex B, theta. Then look at this. In the big triangle, we have that this 90 degree angle plus theta plus angle A, well, of course, that's 180 degrees. But in this small right triangle, we also have a right angle and angle A, which means that this missing angle to add up to 180 must also be theta. Again, that's because 90 plus A plus theta is 180 in the big triangle. In the small triangle, we have 90 plus A, so it must be plus theta. And then going back to this right triangle, it must actually have all the same angles, 90 plus theta, 
plus? Well, this must be A, because we know that angle A combines with 90 and theta to make 180. Now, having established these similarities, we get some very useful proportions. Indeed, in the big triangle, the long side BC to the hypotenuse AB must be the same as that corresponding ratio in this right triangle, the long leg BD to its hypotenuse, which is BC. Sorry for that horrible fraction bar. Again, this is set up by comparing comparing this triangle to the big one. And we create a similar proportion by looking at the ratio of the small leg to the hypotenuse, that's AC to AB. And now if we focus our attention on the small right triangle, look at the small leg to the hypotenuse. That's a ratio of AD to AC, which of course must be the same as this ratio because the triangles are similar. So those are two proportions resulting from the similarity. I'm gonna put a comma just to separate them. Now we're nearly done. Take this equation, multiply both sides by BC. So on the left, we have BC squared, and on the right, we have AB times BD. Take this equation and multiply both sides by AC. So on the left, we have AC squared, and on the right, we have AB times AD. Now, we can add these two equations together. So on the left side, we're gonna have AC squared plus BC squared. You can see that we are getting warmer. And on the right side, we're gonna factor out an AB from that sum, so we have AB multiplied by BD plus AD. But what is BD plus AD? Well, going back to our triangle, BD plus AD is in fact the hypotenuse of the big right triangle, AB. So this is actually AB times a, B. Wouldn't you know it, it's actually A, B squared, thus establishing the Pythagorean theorem. The sum of the squares of the legs, A, C squared plus B, C squared, is equal to the square of the hypotenuse, in this case, A, B squared. That's a very simple proof. We construct one altitude, argue similarity, and then do a little bit of algebra. Some may argue that this is actually a bit of a trigonometric proof of the Pythagorean theorem. If you look at this ratio, BC to AB, well, here's BC, here's AB, so that's actually cosine theta, the adjacent side to the hypotenuse. And it's equal to BD over BC, which looking at this right triangle is adjacent over hypotenuse. It's just equating cosines. Similarly, this equation is equating sines. AC to AB, well, that's opposite over hypotenuse. Same thing for AD over AC with the small right triangle. I don't think that argument for this being a trigonometric proof actually holds any water, but it's interesting to note. I'll be curious to know how many of you learned this proof in school or perhaps were assigned to do it as an exercise. Again, it's often the case that a more geometric proof like this is presented in class. And you might not agree with me that this is the simplest proof of the Pythagorean theorem, which is fine. But in terms of the construction, this is really straightforward. The proof should begin with consider an arbitrary right triangle and then we just construct an altitude and it's gravy from there. Compare that to something like this. Begin with an arbitrary right triangle uh, okay, <laughs> then then what do you do? Anyhow, seeing how simple this proof is, why did Euclid opt for the much more complicated construction with the rectangles? Why didn't he use this proof? Well, the interesting thing is that he did use this proof. However, it doesn't show up until Proposition 31 of Book 6. And in this proof, he's actually using our strategy to prove not the Pythagorean theorem, but a somewhat somewhat generalized version of it. Instead of proving that the sum of the squares on the legs equals the square on the hypotenuse, he proves that the sum of the areas of any rectilinear figures on the legs equals the area of any rectilinear figure on the hypotenuse. So he does in fact use the line of argumentation that we just discussed. Of course, he keeps it very geometric. Even more interestingly, according to Proclus, a Greek philosopher born in 412 AD who wrote a commentary of the elements, that proof might have been the only one actually due to Euclid. The rest was just him collecting already extant knowledge into a very nicely made book. And that raises the question even further. If it was Euclid, 
Euclid's own proof, why didn't he use that one for the Pythagorean theorem? Well, again, that occurred in book six. Simpler proofs, such as this one, often rely on proportions, ratios, and similarity. In the elements, proportions and ratios aren't even defined until book five. And similarity isn't defined until book six. And remember, the Pythag theorem is the closer for book one of the elements, so he simply wouldn't have had these concepts available to him at that point in the book. It's obviously not a very good book if you're trying to build up geometry and referring to a later point of the book to justify an earlier point. And with so many geometry classes still following Euclid somewhat closely, they may have the same issue of being at a point where the Pythagorean theorem should be discussed, but similarity and proportion have not been discussed yet. And that also makes this a common candidate for proof to do in the exercises that you might not see in class. Of course, there are other famous proofs such as this one, which are pretty simple and don't require similarity, but proofs like this in Euclid's time weren't viewed as some geometry that's justifying a ton of algebra, but rather these were proofs that consisted of cutting, pasting and translating rigid bodies, keeping in mind that if we just copy and paste a geometric figure and slide it around, that's not going to change its area. Appealing to that intuition of physical reality might not have been something Euclid wanted to do in his Pythagorean theorem proof, which would leave a proof like this off limits. Another very likely argument for why Euclid would use the proof he did instead of opting for something like this is supported by the author Tobias Dant in his book, The Bequest of the Greeks. And that argument is that the Greeks viewed things geometrically. A number A is not some purely abstract thing, but rather the measure of a line segment in Euclidean space. Similarly, a number A squared is not just the number A times A, it's the area of the square whose side lengths are A. That's what A squared is, it's a measure of area. And of course, we're reminded of this geometric view of mathematics held by the Greeks when we look at how these propositions are stated. Indeed, Euclid didn't say a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Here at the end of book one, when he proves the Pythagorean theorem, it's stated as, in a right-angled triangle, the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the sides. We're actually picturing a square on the hypotenuse, and it's that square whose area is equal to these squares on the other legs. Euclid also, if you're curious, does not mention Pythagoras once in this book, even when he brings up this theorem. So how many of you were shown the proof from the elements for the Pythagorean theorem in school? How many of you were shown this really simple similarity proof? How many of you, like me, were shown this proof? Despite all the options, many people are still just shown that classic proof from the elements. The philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer was not a huge fan of this proof, saying that lines are drawn, we know not why, and it afterwards appears they were traps which close unexpectedly and take prisoner the assent of the astonished reader. And hey, while we're talking about Euclid, I actually have Euclid here on my underpants. Here he is, imagined as a pigeon. There are several other pigeon holes and several other math pigeons on these underpants, inspired by the classic pigeonhole principle. You can check out other awesome pigeonhole principle and math-related products on my store, mathchin.com. Link in the description, and link also in the description to the book The Pythagorean Theorem, A 4,000-Year History by Eli Mayor. That provided much of the info I used in this video, and of course, other sources are in the description as well. Let me know in the comments if you had any questions, and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm unstable, I'm feeling hard to keep the cable cut and unsort the table If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal I Wish to sell my own fake cause I'm jaded Hate the odds that I calculated Press and pull and pray and push it all the way through the whole blue planet faded Psycho